So thank you all for coming today to the orientation for the virtual reality research study. Uh, my name is AJ Mittal. I'm one of the original student uh, co-investigators for this study. I was there since it was an idea to partnering with some faculty and some engineers uh, to create content. And then now to this really exciting phase where we're starting to enroll patients. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the background uh, and the purpose of the study, uh, and as well as what our goals are. So originally, um, back in, I think, 20, late 2017, um, I had first experienced virtual reality visiting a friend's apartment, and he had a Oculus Rift set up. And I think that experience alone was really transformative in my uh, perception of that technology and really the impact it could have. Um, at that same time, you know, I was also a volunteer at uh, the child life um, program uh, uh, at the pediatric cardiac intensive care unit. It's called Dream Team. Uh, and I kept thinking how great VR could be as an application for those kids. Um, particularly, I was thinking about education. A lot of the times when kids go into, uh, you know, long-term intensive care, they're missing out on um, many great things especially when it comes to education. Uh, so I had first thought about that opportunity and um, then it came into let's explore it as a research project because it was really the best way to move forward with this type of idea and implementing it within a hospital system, especially one that's uh, academic like U of Health. Um, from there, I was also connected with uh, a friend of mine uh, who is in another organization called Streetlight his name is Jonathan Wakim, and um, together we were able to meet Dr. Tung Nguyen, who is a pediatric hemonc physician, and with his support, we were able to really progress the study, and originally, the, uh, our focus was looking at pediatrics patients and suturing, um, but later on, we wanted to move into adult populations, and that was mainly because uh, there was this, um, there's a lot of challenges doing a clinical research study to begin with, let alone being a student doing it. And when the coronavirus uh, came about, uh, it made a lot of restrictions even more challenging, especially when it came to involving pediatric patients. And it looked like there's actually a better opportunity to proceed forward with uh, adult population. And that's why we decided to move forward with that. And luckily we were connected with great people on the oncology ward. And that kind of brings us up to where we are today. Um, so like I was saying a little earlier uh, before the recording, um, augmented reality as well as virtual reality is a really exciting place to be. Uh, the technology really has uh, you know, a really a transformative impact on how we'll live our lives in the next coming years. And a lot of the neat things are happening right now uh, until that more wide scale adoption will come about with, um, with just the advancement of the technology. And with that, I kind of want to proceed on with some things that are really relevant to your roles as research assistants. I think the first thing uh, we'll touch on is we'll go to the research assistant drive. So let me just get that pulled up here in a second. Um, but the research assistant drive is your go-to place for all the information. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now. Perfect. So you all received the email not too long ago, giving you access to this. And um, you know, on the informed consent and surveys folder, th these are the three documents that every time you go to the Hemonc ward, or in the future, it could be cardiology or a different department, you're going to be using some uh, variation of these uh, three forms. And I want to first talk on the pre procedure and patient survey sheet. So, pre procedure just means right before. Um, they're going to have whatever procedure is happening. So uh, in the beginning, we're going to be doing lumbar puncture and bone marrow transplants, uh, or sorry, uh, and, and bone marrow um, uh, biopsies, rather. And uh, it, in, th 
this, what you'll be doing is you'll be writing the patient's name. Uh, right here, you'll also be writing the group. So we divide the study into two main groups. It's gonna be control as well as virtual reality. Control is just people who are gonna be using the, nat the normal um, clinical distractions that, that are our standard of care. Um, an important thing is also the start time. So that just can be the time right on your watch when they start the procedure. The purpose of doing the timing is to see in the long run whether there is a difference in how long it takes the procedure to be done when we use a distraction like virtual reality. The patient PRN means the, um, the medical record no uh, number of the patient. That is something you can get right after the, um, the study is done or before you enroll uh, uh, or before the procedure happens. Um, after the patient has consented to uh, being in the procedure. Collection code, we have a standardized method and system we'll be showing you guys in the near future. So you can properly um, write a code on them and that's how we basically de-identify the patient as part of the study. Type of VR experience refers to the program being used. So, um, you know, we have original content that Drew has been working on uh, for, you know, almost three years now. Uh, but there's also other content that we're going to be exploring over time as well. And the VR device is um, whatever device we're going to be using. So at the time of this recording, it is the Oculus Quest 2. In the future, there could be perhaps Apple has a VR headset. Um, Google makes a, a better one. Uh, it's really, we're going to explore what is the best in class at the time and try to incorporate that into our study. Uh, demographics, again, are really basic things. Um, things you're going to get from the patient filling it out. You write down the procedure type, you write down the location uh, for this case, and early on in the study, you'll be the lower back. The heart rate, respiration rate, O2 sat, and blood pressure are not things you have to measure. They're going to be um, already collected in the patient's medical record and you could just ask the nurse um, or whoever whatever clinical staff is there to provide that information. Um, now here is where we actually get uh, the patient to respond. We want to understand what their pain is before the procedure. Really the purpose of our study is to look at can the virtual reality you know decrease perceived pain as well as perceived anxiety. And that's why we structured the survey. So it clearly asks, you know, where are you at right now on a pain level? We use a one to 10 scale, which is indicative of a Likert scale. And that's a um, standard kind of a research scale. Uh, additionally, we ask how anxious the patient is. And it's a similar fashion of one to five scale. Um, and those are our baseline measurements uh, for the study. Then moving forward, we ask a series of uh, questions that are you know, secondary findings to our project. We want to know the history of motion sickness because motion sickness can have an impact on how you perceive the entire experience with virtual reality. We, uh, fear of needles is another measurement that we're interested in knowing. Uh, familiarity with virtual reality. Uh, it is an up and coming technology, but although many have heard of it, not many have maybe used it, so we want to know whether they have used it in the past, and if so, when. Additionally, we have this standardized uh, questionnaire um, that basically assesses surgical fear before the procedure. And they're really simple questions. They're all in that uh, zero to 10 scale. And additionally, there's also a, a non-applicable uh, uh, choice. So some procedures, are different than other procedures, of course. And whether we're doing things like a cardiac ablation or cardiac catheterization in the future, or we're doing these lumbar punctures, uh, they're, they're gonna have a little different um, kind of risks associated with them. So um, for certain uh, things like, I'm afraid my health will deteriorate because of this procedure, that might not be totally applicable to a lumbar puncture but it might be very well applicable to a cardiac um, catheterization or ablation type of procedure. Uh, so keep those things in mind, but essentially these are definitely things we have the patient fill out right before they do this, the, um, uh, the procedure. And one thing I wanted to actually note real quick is this start time, uh, 
By start time, I mean specifically when the procedure happens. And I classify that as when the first incision or anything like that has occurred. Uh, in a previous email, you saw some videos about um, how those procedures look. So you're not totally um, you know, surprised by how it goes when you're there for the first time. But, um, but that pretty much goes over the entire uh, pre-procedure survey. And then I wanna hand it over to um, Gabe to then discuss the post-procedure uh, survey. So let me share my screen here. Um, can you all see it? Yes. Awesome. So um, just like the pre-procedure survey, we have the participant name, the PRN, and the collection code. Um, and just like with the start time, after the procedure is finished, just record the time on your watch and calculate how long the procedure uh, took. And so after that, we have part one, which is the vitals during and after, or during the intervention. Now, um, there may be a bit of a problem with regards to this because um, for the specific operations we have in mind currently, I don't think the patients will be hooked to a monitor where you can easily record these um, vitals. However, that's not too bad because uh, we have part two, uh, which is after intervention, which is likely going to be more important. Um, just another note on part one though, there is um, talk of maybe putting a pulse oximeter, which will allow us to get heart rate and oxygen saturation, but not respiration rate and blood rate, um, or sorry, blood pressure uh, during the intervention. Um, so for part two, um, this is uh, basically guaranteed because the nurses who you will be working with will take these vitals uh, 10 minutes after the procedure and that's just uh, standard for them. And so um, you, you could get these vitals from, uh, from the nurses and so that would be no problem. And um, for other, for non-vitals such as pain and anxiety, um, I would just ask the patient to rate, the, rate their pain and anxiety on this scale uh, these are important because this is supposed to be a distraction-based therapy, and so these are very key measures that we want to have for the study. And so for the third part, it is uh, another survey just like the one in the pre-procedure, but it is simpler. Um, so for the patient VRU survey, um, again, it's just measuring um, more specifically how anxious or scared they were and how effective the VR treatment was. For part four, um, there will be a control group. So um, not all of the patients will be having the VR headset that we give them during the procedure. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And again, these are just some common questions that we would like to know. Uh, especially since part four will help inform us of what we can do better in, in later iterations of this study, especially as we also try to expand to other procedures in the future. Sorry, and now I will hand it off to Suva to talk about informed consent. Okay, so... Can you guys see that? Wait, can you guys hear me? Yes, uh, yes. it looks good too, Okay, 
So the VR study informed consent form. So with this form, basically we have to get like consent from the patients before we do the experiment because we have to legally en enroll them. So first you'll see like you have to fill out like your name at this part right here. So if you're the research assistant, you'll fill out your name and the name of person seeking your consent line. And then for the place of employment and position, you will usually put like e EACN researcher, but yeah. So the concert, consent form is basically like, it gives like general information about what the study entails. So it's good to go over this with the patient before you start the experiment. Um, so here you'll just put like the name of the patient. So the form, it kind of goes into more information. It says like what the study is going to be, like what type of data we're going to collect from the patient, how long the, like the experiment might take. So it'll take like around 30 to 30 minutes to one hour. Um, it also, the form also kind of goes over like the risks and the benefits for the patient. So some of the risks are like, if it's like uncomfortable to wear the headset or like if there's like nausea um, for like the patients. So those are like some of the risks, risks for the patients. And so the benefits would be like um, getting more information about VR, like the technology itself, or like if the benefits to, for the patient would be also like, um, them getting relief from pain from their procedure. So uh, yeah, so that basically the form just goes through that. Like it will also talk about like how many people are expected to be in the study. And so it would be uh, good if you guys could um, read through this yourselves before you start like collecting data so that at the end, you could open it up to questions to the patients. And so you'd be able to answer those. Um, also, there's like a section about like withdrawing from the study, which you should like make sure to talk about with the patient because they could withdraw from the study at any time. Um, and so at the end of the consent form, there's these two signatures and it's really important to make sure you get these this part like filled out. So at the, the top line, the signature person obtaining a consent and authorization, that would be your name. And then you would have the patient sign here. So, yeah. And then, uh, okay, so that would be the informed consent form. Um, another thing is that I'll be talking about is, uh, sorry. Um, so in this folder right here, if you click it right here, this is for like the research assistants. So if you click this folder right here, so these two links uh, are for you guys. So if you need to miss one of your like shifts, you can like uh, fill out this form. So you just fill out this form. Although the shifts and like shift times may be a little different since it's a little different for this study. But yeah, so you'll fill out this form uh, if you need to miss any uh, of your shifts. And for this link right here, so this link right here is like the question concerns reporting form. So if you have like any like anything you wanna say about the study, like anything that you think we could improve on or like any issues, you can report here and it's anonymous. And yeah, so you can report here because <laughs> uh, we want to know as much as possible, like if there are any issues, so yeah. Okay, so I think that's it. Cool, and I'll, I'll uh, I'm gonna go over the VR use procedure a bit, uh, just so you guys, it's going to be a little bit difficult since you guys don't have it right in front of you, but we're going to go through it uh, just so you get the gist of it. Uh, 
So they're going to be using an Oculus Quest 2 headset, which is like the latest headset that is on the market. It's like four months old. It's, it's portable. It's, uh, it's powerful. Uh, and it can run anything we really want it to run. Um, it should be signed into the Equal Access Clinic uh, account that we made. It, has a, it should have like an avatar that looks like a little box there. Uh, if it doesn't look like that, uh, you can log in using this account down here. Uh, and you guys should have access to this eventually. Uh, it should, maybe it's in the drive. I don't know. Uh, we'll put it in there. Uh, so you should have the headset. You should have the quest two. There's two quest controllers. Uh, really, you only need one, but I mean, don't lose the two. Uh, there's a carrying case, so you can bring it around. Uh, if we're not sure if we're going to use headphones or not. Um, it's possible, and it helps with audio, but it's not really necessary. So if we use headphones, we're going to use headphones there. And we're also going to have a, like an accompanying tablet. Uh, and this is pretty important. So we're going to have like an Android tablet with a, an Oculus app on it. And essentially what that app lets you do is control the headset without wearing the headset. Uh, so you can have the headset on the patient and you can control what they're seeing. Uh, uh, you can like calibrate it for them without having to like mess with it yourself. And uh, just as an overview, this is what the headset looks like. There's like a, a thing you put on your head. There's two side straps and a above strap. And that helps you adjust for like head width and head height. There's also lenses on the inside you can adjust. Uh, there's a video I'll show real quickly. That, uh, basically, you're going to try to adjust it with the patient to see what works with them the best. Um, there's some things that you might need to know, like charging port is on the left side with the headphone jack. The power button is on the right side. So you can't really see it in this picture, but it would be where my cursor is. Um, and you press that once to make it go to sleep. You hold it to make it go on or off. There's a volume button on the bottom, which uh, probably just want to keep volume on the max. Um, but if, it's, if they say it's too loud, you can decrease it. Now, there's two controllers. And like I said before, they're only going to use one controller. Uh, they look, there's like the real picture of them. But here's like a labeled image. Uh, really, all you're going to use in all the setup and what the patient's going to use are these triggers on the end of the controller and these joysticks, which will help like uh, it's part of the game that they, at least the, the original content that we made. Now, the other content we use might use something different. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so just as an overview, if they wear glasses, there's a, um, I'll go. You're supposed to wear glasses when you're wearing the headset. Uh, it helps them view it um, in full clarity. And there's a little plastic thing you put in there to make sure they can fit it on their head well. Um, and you just remove this foam part um, that was around it, and you put it back on. And then you'll do that before you start everything. Uh, it'll be pretty obvious if they're wearing glasses. Um, then you want to turn on the headset. And now there's two parts of this, really. You're going to set it up, the headset, like by yourself. You're going to like set up the initial settings, uh, like calibrating it and getting it uh, started. And then you're going to put on the uh, patient and use the accompanying tablet with it. So you're going to turn on the headset, uh, should be logged in. You're going to put on the headset or just look into it, like you can just hold it up to your head. Um, and you're gonna press, you're gonna have one of the controllers, you're gonna press a few times. And then there's this thing called the guardian. Um, it's basically just the safe area around uh, a play area. Uh, you kind of want make, to make this as big as possible in your room uh, because if it's not big enough, there's gonna be weird bars on the screen. Uh, and the patient won't be really moving during the procedure. so. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go play one of these videos real quick. Uh, so what it's going to have you do when you turn on the headset, it's going to say, like, make a room scale boundary. And basically, room scale boundary is your play space. Uh, 
as they describe it. Um, you're going to want to include like the hospital bed or wherever the patient's going to be, as well as where you are, so uh, you don't have any uh, distractions. And now it's going to ask you to set the floor location. And what that means is you're telling the headset where the floor is. And you do that by touching the controller to the floor and pressing the trigger. Uh, and then there's going to be some on-screen instructions as well. Uh, and then you're going to like hold the trigger and make a circle around wherever it's going to be used. And it'll make like a, a 2D shape around your room. And that's going to be where you can safely play. Uh, yeah, and like I said, just make it as big as possible. Uh, make it the pool room. And they might change this to make it easier in the future, but that's how it is right now. And the important thing is don't use a stationary boundary because that's like a really small boundary zone. And don't put the headset to sleep or else you'll have to do this entire thing again. Um, now, once you do that, the headset is set up and you can put it on the patient. Uh, and the first thing you want to do before you do that is make sure you're casting to your Android tablet, which you can follow this when you have the tablet. Uh, it should be in the Oculus app. You press a button and it should work if you're on the same Wi-Fi. Uh, you put the headset on the patient. Uh, so there's a quick, uh, make sure they're comfortable. There's a few things you have to do. Uh, this is kind of supposed to match their eye width. Um, so it's a little bit different for everyone. So, um, sorry, it kind of zoomed past that. You want to change the lenses by moving them physically. Uh, and this is kind of a trial and error thing. If it, uh, yeah, you kind of just have to play with it, see what works best. Hopefully it just works on the first time you put it on. Uh, and you don't have to mess with the lenses, but you probably will have to mess with the straps on the side, which, so, it also zooms through that, oh man. So there's two side straps and you adjust them with these little ball things or bar things. Um, so that adjusts the, the width tightness. And then there's this top strap, which is, so you slide those, this one you, it's like a Velcro thing, you just make it tighter. And you can also adjust the angle of the headset. Um, and like I said, since you can't really see what the patient's seeing, it's gonna be a bit of trial and error to see uh, what looks clear to them. And they'll be seeing the menu at whenever they're, you're doing this. Uh, so they should be able to tell like if they can read the text or something on the screen. Yeah, and once you have it on them, you can set up, uh, you can calibrate them uh, with your, your tablet and you can launch whatever app they're using with the tablet. And yeah, once they're um, done with it, there's some sanitation procedures we're gonna implement. They're not entirely um, final right now, but basically it's wiping it down with Lysol wipes or some antiseptic wipe. Uh, before and after, and uh, using a microfiber cloth on the lenses because those are more delicate. And that's about it. It's, uh, it's a little bit lengthy, but uh, once you do it once in person, it probably will click. Uh, it's not too complicated uh, once you try it out.